Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to 12 Faces of Sober Speaks podcast. I am your host, Kenneth L. Watson Jr. This is season two, episode 43. And today's guest, I have, um, I, I haven't really gotten to know him yet, only because, you know, I'm gonna say a big shout out to uh, Mike. I can't, I'm gonna probably say his name wrong, Fiori. Uh, yeah. he, he, he personally reached out to me and said, you need to have this guy on your podcast. And I was like, okay, let me do some research. And as I did my research and I saw that, you know, he has a, a positive message within the, the sober and clean community. And these are the type of people I would like to have on my podcast to hear their story and hopefully be able to not only impact myself, but be able to impact others that are newly into sobriety, newly getting clean, um, those that are straddling the fence, that are unsure whether or not they they should, you know, get clean and sober. So um, I, I look forward to speaking to him this evening because, like I said, I I, I want to reach as many people as I can in in the sober and clean community because I am. A, a person that this in recovery, uh, I'm uh, celebrating. Matter of fact, in a couple of days, it'll be five years and five months being sober, uh, uh, free of alcohol. Definitely a, a tough uh, journey, but definitely happy that I, I made the decision to quit. And uh, before we go into the introductions, get him on and, and have him share his story, um, you guys can log on to 12facesofsober.com. You can get a signed copy of my book. It um, it just hit the bestseller list uh, February 22nd. It was uh, number one in three different categories for roughly about 48 hours. So I'm happy with that and content. Uh, you can also order it off of Amazon directly. All you gotta do is type in 12 Faces of Sober. On, on my website, you can get um, hoodies, t-shirts. Uh, I have tights for women, uh, workout shorts for women, coffee mugs, and a host of other things. All you gotta do is log on to 12 Faces of Sober, the number 12 facesofsober.com, as well as you can go on YouTube. I have a, a variety of videos, not only interviews, but I also have uh, short videos. Um, I've interviewed uh, a former NFL player. Uh, I'm in the works of trying to get a professional baseball player on as well. So like I said, I'm, I'm not just trying to get the, the regular people. I want the big name people as well. This is what it's about because the sober community and the clean community is being ignored. And now all of a sudden it's, it feels like it's not even making a comeback. It's just social media is making it easy for us to, to, to you know, navigate through and network with other people that, that are like-minded and is trying to do the right thing and that's promote positivity. So without further ado, um, I wanna introduce my guest. His name is Tim. He's a former Marine, an MMA fighter, and he just celebrated a uh, one year of sobriety on, um, was it March? March, was it March 4th? March 5th. March 5th. Okay. I was, I was off by a day. Please forgive me. But uh, that's good. Welcome to uh, 12 Faces Sober uh, podcast, Tim. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Kenneth. I really appreciate it. Man. I look forward to our conversation, brother. Okay. Now, um, uh, as we were just talking a couple minutes ago, why don't you uh, start with, you know, uh, a little bit of a background on yourself, you know, where are you from, uh, your upbringing in terms of, you know, was alcohol something that was around you early, alcohol and drugs, uh, you know, when did you get started, and then we'll go from there. Okay, sounds good. Um, I, I was born and raised here in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, my father was a, a police officer for 37 years, didn't, didn't do drugs. He would drink on occasion, like um, I guess you would call them a normal person. Um, there was no alcohol in my house. My mother actually, as I grew up, was a uh, bodybuilder. Um, so she, no alcohol, no drugs. I don't think she's ever done a drug in her entire life. Mm. Um, my mother still to this day, she'll drink a beer every four or five years. Like it's, it was not even, a, I wasn't around any of that. Um, my father did leave when I was at the age of six years old. So I didn't grow up with my father in my home. Um, and, and as I tell my story, I, I'll, I'll show you how that affected me into my addiction because 
as a young man, I mean, as a young boy at six, seven years old, not growing up with a father, it had a lot of effects on me. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't drink or do drugs or anything um, until high school. Um, ninth grade, uh, we had a freshman party, like a kind of a welcome to high school party. My friend had it. And um, that was the first time I ever tried alcohol. Mm. And I got extremely sick. Mm. I had a huge hangover the next day. And my mom, when she picked me up from, from the kid's house, she knew exactly what was going on. Mm. And uh, for my punishment for that day, we were having actually a cookout. And she made me shuck 50 ears of corn for the cookout. And uh, she was like, here's a bag you could throw up next to it, but you're shucking all these years of corn and hopefully you never drink again. And I didn't drink again. I didn't touch anything until my senior year of high school. So for the next three and a half years, I didn't do anything. Um, I, I, was, I was a junior Olympic boxer all through high school and I was a semi-professional skateboarder. So I, I was in, I was always an athlete. I played football, baseball, but my main thing in high school was boxing and skateboarding. And um, so I, I didn't hang around the people that partied. I didn't hang around people that did drugs or alcohol. Everybody that I hung out with played sports. So that wasn't even a thought for me. But come senior year, um, the summer before senior year, I signed up for the U.S. Marine Corps. Okay. Um, I already knew that's what I wanted to do when I got out of high school. Um, so I didn't want to go to college. I just, I wanted to follow the footsteps. My father was in the army. My brother was in the army. My, both of my grandfathers were in the army. They all served in, um, Vietnam, Korean war, World war II. So I always wanted to be in the military, like the men in my family. So I signed up for the Marine Corps right before senior year. So when senior year came, I kind of was like, you know what? I'm going away next year. Let me have some fun and, and, and experience, you know, my, the senior year of high school, so so you would say. So I went to a couple parties, started drinking some alcohol, started smoking some pot, um, and I finally I found that I I, I really liked it um, mm. at that time in my life. I don't know if it was a, a social thing, if it made it easier for me to talk to girls, if um, I just liked kind of being out of control, but the alcohol really kind of led me into other things because once I started drinking if there was anything else at the party I'd be like yeah I'll try it mm -hmm. so I ended up trying you know LSD uh, PCP pain medicine um, thank god I, I never had the opportunity to do like heroin or cocaine or meth or anything none of that was around but it was more of like the hippie party kind of drugs if you will okay. um so I really kind of dug deep into that my senior year. I was drinking, I was smoking, I, I was doing LSD. And then as the year progressed, I, I stopped boxing, I stopped skateboarding, I stopped hanging around all the athletes, didn't get in trouble. I started hanging around with the guys that like to skip school and go get high, like to skip school and go drink. And, and I found myself starting to do that almost on a daily basis. Um, the weekends would run over to Monday, to Tuesday, to Wednesday, and I was skipping school. We were going out, riding through the park, drinking or, or smoking pie. And, and I kind of at that time thought, you know what? It's just a phase. I'm going away next summer to the Marines. So let me get all this in because next year, you know, I'm, I'm really going to be focused on, on the military. Well, when I got into the military at age 18, the drugs stopped because you can't, I mean, obviously you can't do drugs in the military, mm -hmm. but my alcohol consumption actually skyrocketed. Okay. Soon as I got through boot camp and I got stationed in North Carolina, as soon as we got off at four o'clock, it was drinking time. Mm -hmm. And we're talking 18, 19, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And it was almost encouraged that we drank because we, we, we busted our ass so much. Mm -hmm. And the local bars that were around the base, outside of the base, their model was, if you're old enough to take a bullet for this country, you're old enough to have a cold beer. Mm -hmm. So the only stipulation was you couldn't stand there with the beer in your hand. You'd have to leave it on the bar or the tabletop. So and just in case the authorities walked in, they couldn't directly say you're holding the beer and you're underage. Mm -hmm. But they would serve you all night long. 
No matter, it didn't matter what you wanted, liquor, beer, didn't matter. They would serve you all night long. And, and we would see our sergeants out at these bars and they would kind of give you the nudge like, yeah, this is what you're, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Just as long as your ass is up at 3 a.m. to go running and do your calisthenics, we don't care what you're doing at nighttime. Just be focused and ready in the morning. Mm-hmm. So I did that from 18 to 20. Like, like it, it was my job. Like I trained, we drank, we hung out, we drank, we trained. That was just, that's what I did for two years straight. Mm. Um, I didn't end up doing a full four years in the Marines. I did two and a half. I ended up breaking my ankle three times while in service. Mm-hmm. And on the third time they said, you, you can't, you can no longer be an 0311. I was in infantry. Okay. They said, we, we, can, uh, we can switch your NOS to a desk job, which I, that's not me. I, I, I'm, I go 100 miles an hour. I'm not sitting at a desk. So I was like, no, nah, that's not me. So they're like, okay, well, we can discharge, honorable discharge, and we can send you home. Um, you got two years Montgomery Jai bill. You can go home and we'll discharge you. So that's what I ended up doing. So I ended up coming home at the age of 20. And for the first month, it was great. I was kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm out of the military. I can sleep in. I can do what I want. But after that first month, going into the second and the third month, I got really depressed. Okay. Um, so depressed that I found myself with my stepfather's gun in my lap one day. Mm. And um, I didn't know what to do. Um, I, I became an alcoholic over those last two years Mm. and I was putting a lot of shame on myself that I couldn't finish the Marines because I I was, I kept breaking my ankle. I thought something was wrong with me. Like why couldn't my body hold up to the calisthenics, to the rigorous, uh, you know, training that we did. And I kind of like put that on myself and I found myself with a gun on my lap one day and, and thank God I had a girlfriend at the time. And, um, I called her, I told her how I was feeling, what I was doing. And she came over and put it away. And I ended up telling my mom that I was depressed. I didn't tell her about the gun situation, but I told her I was really depressed. I didn't know what was going on. So she ended up making an appointment for a doctor. We went in, went in and um, you know, I'm going to backtrack real quick. At the age of 14, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Okay. But from 14 all the way through the Marine Corps, I never did anything about it. As a matter of fact, if I would have told the Marines I had bipolar, I wouldn't have been able to join the service. Yeah. So I, I wasn't on medicine. I didn't do anything for that. But when I came home, my depression was so deep and dark that the, the doctors at that time were like, you need to be on medicine for bipolar. Yeah. Um, we have to regulate it. We have to monitor it. And we have to try to get your, your emotions in, in track because you know, in the Marines, for two years, I, I was on a manic, on a manic run. I mean, it was a hundred miles an hour for two years. You had to be on every day. You had to be locked on. And when I came home and had that decompression of that three months, all that high for, for being on high for two years came crashing down mm. and it was lower than low. I mean, it was, I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to shower. I didn't want to brush my teeth. Uh, and like I said, I found myself with a gun on my lap. So went and talked to the doctor that got me on medicine and the medicine kind of worked, but it really wasn't working because I was drinking Mm -hmm. and I started to smoke pot again at the age of 22, 21, 22. So for me, I didn't correlate the two. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I would tell the doctors the medicine isn't working. I don't know what's going on. So they're, their solution was, well, let's up the milligrams. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not working. Let's try this one since that's not working. Well, since that's not working, let's try two or three at the same time because this combination might work. And if that's not working, we'll up the milligrams over here. We'll we'll take one off. We'll add another one. And that went on for years. Um, They could never find that, that, that proper mix that would work for me. But little did they know I was drinking every single day and smoking pot. So the medicine is not going to work no matter what milligram they put me on, no matter what concoction that they put me on, it's not going to work because the alcohol and the drugs are in my body. Right. 
So, so, and let, me, that, let, me, let me stop you right there. Yeah. <clears throat> First, um, thank you for your service. Absolutely. Number two, were you at Camp Pendleton? No, that's uh, California. Right. No, I'm just, no, I'm saying that did you go to uh, Camp Pendleton for base? No, no, I was in uh, South Carolina, Paris Island. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, no, I was just, I was just curious because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm from San Diego and I'm, you know, Camp Pendleton's out there, but I, I know um, exactly how you feel because I was in the army. I did six years. And as you mentioned, the, the culture in the military is horrible in terms of drinking. And, and, and I know exactly what you mean, but I was a cook. So our hours of uh, our hours were different. Whew. Yeah, we, we yes. either, either <laughs> got off at 12, 12 or one, or we got off at seven or eight o'clock that night. So it was like, either way, no matter what time we got off, we were drinking. So I, I understand completely. And I wanted to ask you now for you, the, the drinking culture in the Marines, like, do you think that it, it, it carried it, it, it carried over and like in, in terms of like now now you're you know you got your discharge and you were already as you say you know you were doing your your duties every day drinking evenings weekends whatever it was were you do you feel once you got out that regardless of you getting out that didn't stop the drinking just continued oh absolutely no I, I I kind of looked at it as well, I don't have to get up tomorrow morning so I can drink more actually. Mm -hmm. I have no responsibilities. There's nothing stopping me. So now I can go out and hang out with my friends. I can go to bars. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can go out to clubs. I can do all this stuff because I have no responsibilities anymore. I can sleep in until 12 o'clock. And if I had a hangover, it's not going to affect me because I don't have a job yet. I was just getting home mm -hmm. and, and none of that mattered. It was kind of like it, it, I had fun before. I, I did the Marines for two and a half years. And when I got home, it was kind of like I told myself I deserved to have fun again because of what I went through. Mm -hmm. and, and I found myself doing that every single day. It wasn't on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It was Monday through Sunday. I mean, that's what I did. And my mother would say, say to me all the time, boy, you really picked up a lot of drinking in the Marines. I'm like, yeah, I did. She said, well, that, you know, son, that's not good. You know, you're drinking. I find you drinking every day. I'm like, yeah, but mom, I'm used to it now. You know, that, I, I'm 20. You know, that's what we did. That, that's what we did for the last two and a half years. You know, I, I'm used to it. And she would always say, well, that's not good. You need to slow down a little bit, maybe keep it to the weekends. I don't mind you drinking. Just keep it to the weekends. Because at that time, when I came home, I moved back in with my mom. Okay. So, so she saw me drinking every single day. I mean, I had. I had bottles in my room, like it, like there were trophies all around my shelf and stuff like that. It was kind of like, this is what a young man does when he gets home from the service, you know? Okay. Um, so I was, I definitely kept that going because at that time for me, it was, it was like a part of who I was at that point, mm -hmm. you know, and, and hanging out with my buddies and stuff. I thought it was cool because I could drink them under the table now, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was used to drinking twice as much as them and I'd still feel fine. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean and they'd be like man you're not even drunk and I'm like yeah yeah this is what this is all we did you know this is how we this is how we live mm -hmm. um so it did become it become routine it, it became who I was you know and, and it didn't at that time it, it didn't I didn't think it affected me okay. you know I, I just thought it was something that I was doing in my 20s um, I always thought in the back of my head, it was always just kind of a phase. I really did. Um, I always thought, you know, in a couple of years, you know, I'll get a, I'll get a job or, you know, I'll meet a girl, we'll have kids and, and the drinking will slow down because I'll have responsibilities again and I'll have stuff to do. But within the year of me being home, um, I started dating my wife, um, whom I went to middle school and high school with, but we were just friends. We never dated or anything like that, but I ended up meeting her at a party one night mm -hmm. and she was single and I was just getting home and we started dating. And uh, within a year of us dating, we moved into a house. I got a VA loan. I was able to get myself a nice townhouse. Um, and then I got a job mm -hmm. um, and I started working for 84 Lumber. Um, so I was a co-manager and those guys, I mean, when you're working in, a, in an industry of carpenters and construction, 
drinking is also acceptable in that line of work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, those guys work from 6 a.m. To, to whenever the sun goes down. They're working 10, 12 hours a day. And the first thing they do when they get off or even sometimes during the, during the day is have a beer. They bring coolers full of beer. So everything that I did when I got out of the Marines was always, always constructed around drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I never really thought anything different of it, to be honest with you. It was just kind of like, OK, well, this is just I go to work now. You know, I have a home, I have a vehicle. I'm paying my bills. I work hard. Why can't I drink at the end of the night? I was always justifying my use to drink. Mm. I was always justifying it. Mm. When my bills are paid, I have a vehicle, I have a home, everything's going good with our relationship. Why can't I drink? Mm -hmm. um, I ended up having our first daughter about two years after we moved in. And my drinking did kind of back off a little bit at that time. Mm. Um, Instead of drinking Monday through Sunday, it ended up being like Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, um, getting up with the child, taking care of her. It did actually subside my drinking for a while, for probably the first year of her life. Um, but as soon as, you know, she could start walking and, and it wasn't getting up every two, three hours to feed her and all that phase went away, my drinking picked back up. Um, and then I started to lose jobs mm. um my, my 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 drinking started to affect i started calling out a lot i started getting sick had to leave work a lot and i was always just like well maybe this isn't the job for me i was always excusing the fact that that it was the alcohols it was it was the reason it, alcohol was the reason i was losing these jobs mm -hmm. and and I, and after having a four year job and being a manager and going good, all of a sudden I lost that job and I started just bunny hopping to job after job after job. And it would last six months, nine months, three months, you name it. You know, it would, I get past probation and a couple months later, I'd be like, you know what? I don't like this job. And I'd just stop going. And, and that happened so much i am 45 years old and since being out of the marine corps i've had 46 jobs mm. and that's how for for 20 plus years I, I would just get a job lose a job get a job lose a job but during that time i would always find my way back to carpentry or in the construction field in some way or the other um, so that's actually what I do now. I'm a carpenter. I've been a carpenter for a very long time, but I would always find my way getting back to that. You know, in my twenties, you know, we had our, my first daughter, then we had our second daughter, um, I ended up moving to a, a nice big farm. And, uh, I, that's about the age of 27. So, uh, I started drinking more again, like, and I'm talking like 12, 12 beers a day. Yeah. Um, it went to six beers for, you know, for the first couple of years to now I'm drinking 12 pack a day. And, uh, the wife would, she would say stuff to me, like you're drinking a lot. Can you take the next couple of days off, please? Cause it's, you know, you're, you're becoming an asshole. Um, you're not taking care of responsibilities around the house. You're not helping out with the kids. Um, you really need to take it, take some time off. So I would, I, I would take a day or two, maybe three days off and just, kind of let things blow over and calm down and then all of a sudden she find a 12 pack in the in the fridge again mm. um and that would go on for years mm. that would just go on for years 12 pack a day she'd say something i'd stop for two or three days or i would drink so much that i was so sick the next day i couldn't drink mm. so i would wait a day or two until i felt better and then drink again and then be right back on it and I would actually drink a little bit more to make up for the two or three days that I didn't drink. <laughs> you are telling the story of my past. I love it. That's <laughs> exactly what happened. Well, I, man, yeah. I didn't drink the last two, two or three days. I could have 18 beers tonight. You know? And that's exactly what I did. And then it'll be like, well, the beers, that's not doing good. I better throw some shots in there too. You know what I mean? I want, I want that warm feeling in my chest. These beers aren't doing it. So I, I drank like that from my 20s, all the way up until my 30s, all the way up until 42. 
Mm. I drank 12 to 18 beers a day, every single day. And I was smoking pot every day. Um, I, I was thinking, you know, pot's not a big deal. Everybody smokes pot. I didn't think I had a problem with it. I was justifying, I was justifying my addictions every time I picked up an addiction. Mm -hmm. I, I would justify it. Um, in my 30s, at the age of 32, I, I told my wife, you know, I'm really missing competing in a sport. I'm really missing that adrenaline rush. And I would like to go back into doing something. And she said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I, I want to fight again. I said, I haven't been in a, in, a, in a ring against somebody in, since I was in high school. I said, you know, I'm in pretty good shape. I'm, I'm in my 30s. I really want to do it. And she said, I'll tell you what, I'll back you. She, she let me quit my job. She's like, I'll give you one year. You can do it and we'll see how it goes at the end of the year. If you still want to do it and you're making a little money, then you can continue. If not, you need to go back and, and get a job. Mm -hmm. So she actually supported my decision. So I went and I started training at local gyms. I started boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, Jiu-Jitsu, Judo. I started doing all these different uh, martial arts. And I found myself within six to seven months having my first fight at local local places around in Maryland. And then by the end of the year, I was actually making $500 to $1,000 a fight. So I was actually bringing some money. And it wasn't a lot, but I was bringing some money in that was paying for my training. So she allowed me to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. So I fought for the next five years from 32 to 37. Okay. Um, I ended up at the end of my fighting. I was, I was fighting at Harris casino. Mm -hmm. uh, I was fighting on TV. Um, I had sponsors. I was making almost $3,000 a fight. So it really jumped up. I fought for a belt at one point. So it was kind of looking up and I was like, man, I, I might be able to do this. Well, at the age of 37, I had torn my rotator cuff mm -hmm. in a fight. And um, after the fight, I went to go get dressed and I couldn't lift my arm. Like I it just, it was immobile. And my trainer was like, what's wrong? I said, I can't put my shirt on. You got to help me. He said, what'd you do? I said, I think I tore my rotator cuff. Mm. And uh, I, I go out to the crowd and my wife's standing there and I give her a hug. But I put my left arm over, which my right hand's my dominant. And she said, well, that was weird. How, how can you hug me like that? And I was like, I can't move my arm. Mm. And she's like, are you kidding me? I was like, nah, I did something to it. She's like, okay, well, let's go to the doctor and see what happens. So I ended up going to the doctor, ended up tearing it in three different places. And I had to get immediate surgery on my rotator cuff. And um, they started giving me pain medicine. Mm. And because I guess I have, I, I have a high tolerance for things, uh, pain, alcohol, drugs, they gave me a, high milligrams, 10, 15, 20 milligram, three, four times a day. Mm. And my surgery was a 10 month recover, um, rehabilitation, you know, physical therapy. And so for 10 months, I, I was taking, you know, six 20 milligram oxycodones a day. Mm. And during that time, I got addicted to pain medicine. Mm. Um, and I would keep telling them my shoulder hurts, my shoulder hurts, my shoulder hurts. So they, they would just keep giving them to me, just keep giving them to me, just keep giving them to me. And during rehabilitation, um, where they were doing an MRI, they found I had problems with my neck, um, from mixed martial arts, from weight training, from exercising. So I ended up having to get two rhizotomies in my neck, which is a minor surgery, uh, mm. to alleviate the pain. So then there were two surgeries on top of the rotator cuff. I ended up having two tears around my, um, around my, my pelvis. I had two hernias mm. that I didn't know. So I ended up having to have those repaired. So within like an 18 month to 20 month period, I ended up having like five surgeries. Um, now, 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 now let me ask you this. Cause I, this is definitely the first time you asking this question. Now, you, you went to the doctors and you sounds like you continuously asked for a higher dosage or more medication. Didn't they like question anything? Like, I, you know, I understand that they, you know, they just pretty much sign and write the prescription, but wouldn't they think like as a professional in that field, wouldn't they want to question the patient saying, okay, yeah, I think you're asking for too many pills. 
you know, you're, you're, you're coming back to, you know, like how, how is that? Like I said, I've never, you know, I've, I've taken pain pills, but never abused it. So I'm, I'm, I've always wondered like, okay, if, if people are out here getting addicted to these pills, like that, wouldn't the doctor have <clears throat> more of a say so like limiting, you know, the, these prescriptions. So when you first, when I first had surgeries, the actual surgeon was giving me the pain medicine. Okay. After three months, they can no longer give you pain medicine. They actually refer you to a pain management clinic. Okay. So now, now you're dealing with another doctor who only deals in pain management. Also, oh, yeah. and what I mean, pain management, they want to manage your pain. They don't want to get you off of it. Right. They want to keep you happy and not hurting. Mm -hmm. So it's not their job to get you off. They're there to keep you at a, at a non non painful level. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, those pain management clinics get paid by insurance companies to have their patients use their medicine. Yeah. Um, thank God over the last, what, two, three years or whatever, they've made a lot of changes with that. Um, so if you go into emergency room now, they give you like a week's worth of pain medicine. And then after that, they cut you off and you have to go through, you know, hoops to even try to get pain medicine now, which is, I think is a great thing because four or five years ago when I was going through it, they literally were giving it to me like Tic Tacs. Mm -hmm. And I was never questioned. Um, you had to pee once every couple of weeks to make sure that you had no other drugs in your system. Okay. Um, and I was smoking marijuana, but they didn't ever say anything about it. Okay. Um, I think they were looking for like cocaine or heroin, you know, some the, the heavier drugs. And they never said anything about the marijuana being in my system. So they could just continue to give me, give me pain medicine. Mm -hmm. And this went on for three and a half years of me pain medicine and drinking every day. Mm. And when I mean drinking, I mean, I was still drinking 12, 12 years a day, 12 to 18, it depended and taking pain medicine. Mm. And I found myself, I actually got scared one night. Mm. I, I actually was like, I remember thinking about it, this is how people die. Yeah. Like I'm taking this pain medicine and I'm drinking and, and I still want more. Like, why am I like this? You know, why, why, why isn't enough enough? Why do I have to take everything to the end? Why do I have to take everything to the extreme? You know, little did I know that I was an addict at that time, mm. but I, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't convinced. I, I don't know if that makes sense. I just wasn't, wasn't ready to accept the fact that I was an addict. Mm -hmm. So I remember one night I was sitting on my bed and I was like, man, I, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I was like, I lost another job. My, me and my wife are fighting now. I have a bad relationship with my kids. You know, I mean, my mom, we have a bad relationship with my parents. Everything's going bad in my life. The pain, the medicine, they just keep giving me this damn pain medicine. They won't stop giving it to me. I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I sat on the edge of my bed. And I grabbed a pain bottle and it had 18 Percocets in it. And I took all 18 Percocets and I drank 12 beers. And I remember laying in the bed and I remember praying, please, if this is how I'm supposed to live, please don't wake me up the next day because mm -hmm. I don't want to live like this anymore. The pain's too great. I can't stop drinking. I can't stop taking this pain medicine. I just don't want to live this way. Mm. And I woke up the next day. I went into the bathroom and my refill bottle was sitting in there full of, I was a whole month's prescription. I poured it down the toilet. Mm. And I remember looking in the mirror and I remember telling myself, I don't care how sick I'm going to get. I'm never touching pain medicine again. Good. And I was sick for a full week, week and a half. I mean, the whole flu-like symptoms, going to the bathroom, the shakes, the nausea, throwing up, not being able to eat, not being able to sleep. But I remember continuously looking at myself in the mirror and telling myself, I never want to go through this again. Feel this pain. Remember this because I don't want to do it again. And as of right now today, it's been like five, five and a half years since I've taken any pain medicine. I haven't thought about it. I haven't had an urge for it. I haven't had one anything do it. But my drinking never stopped. Okay. 
it never stopped. Actually, when I stopped taking the pain medicine, I looked for something to replace that feeling of the alcohol and the pain medicine. Mm. So I stopped drinking beer and I started drinking whiskey. Mm. Because for me, drinking 12 beers wasn't getting me to that place I wanted to get fast enough. Mm -hmm. But you start drinking some whis whiskey and you're gonna feel it. <laughs> you're gonna feel it. You're gonna feel it and it's and it's almost immediate mm -hmm. and, and it takes you to a place that the beer never took. Mm. So I started drinking fireball whiskey every single day. Mm. And my addictive mentality, the way I thought was don't get a big bottle of the whiskey because then I'll know exactly how much I'm drinking because I didn't want to know how much I was drinking. So I went and got the miniatures. And when you drink a lot, you can go up and ask for a sleeve of miniatures. And a sleeve of miniatures is 10 of them still in a package. Okay. And they sell it to you as a sleeve as 10 in a package. So I was drinking a 10 of those before lunchtime. Oh, man. And I would find myself after lunch or as soon as work was over at three o'clock, going right back to the liquor store and getting another 10. Mm. So for the next two years, I drank 25 miniatures a day and I ended up uh, measuring them one day in a shot glass. Each miniature is two and a half shots. So I was drinking 25 of those days. So I was drinking upwards of 50 to 65 shots a day of fireball whiskey. Wow. Um, I became a different person. Mm. I, I, I was irritable when the wind blew a different direction. Um, I, I was, my anger was through the roof. Mm. Thank God I was never physically abusive to my family, but it made me very verbally abusive, very angry. I yelled and I said the most nastiest things to the people I love the most. And when you're drinking whiskey like that, I, I tended to, to black out and wake up the next day and be like, good morning. How's everybody doing? And everybody looking at me with, with, you know, three heads. You don't remember what you said last night. You don't remember throwing the cup across the room, smashing it on the wall. You don't remember anything that you did. And I'm like, no, what, I, I don't remember any of that. And I remember my wife saying, it must be nice to be able to do what you want and have no recollection the next day and just start over like nothing happened. When, when me and your kids have to live with this for the rest of our life, because we sure, surely do remember what you did last night. And I would just blow it off. I would just blow it off. And that would actually make me go drink again, because then I felt like a piece of shit. Mm. Then I felt, how would I do that to my family? How could I treat these people that I love the most? the worst and that would put me in that cycle of beating myself up you know depression would set in and, and I would just continuously go in this cycle of I'm a piece of shit I don't deserve my kids I don't deserve my family I don't deserve my wife I don't deserve to live let me drink to get rid of those feelings and then I would feel worse because I was drinking and not dealing with what was going on and it would put me deeper in depression, deeper into sadness, deeper into drinking. And I found myself at the age of 44. I just got a new truck. I went to the liquor store. I hit something on the way. Mm. I, ca I came home and I told my wife, I'm going to bed. I hit something and I went to bed. Woke up the next morning, not remembering me hitting anything. And I tell her, I'm going to go get some water and some milk. And she's like, how are you going to do that? I said in my new truck in the driveway, she said, go outside and look at your truck. Mm -hmm. So I go outside and the passenger front tires hanging off the rim, the side mirror smashed in. Um, and I'm like, what the hell happened? And she looks at me and she says, you don't remember what you hit last night, do you? I said, I have no memory at all. She said, Tim, you could have killed somebody. Or you could have killed yourself. She's like, I can't do this anymore. She's like, you're going to have to leave and go figure this out. I don't want you here around the kids and I don't want to be around you anymore. Mm. So I called AAA, they come, they put a new tire on. I didn't give a shit about the mirror. I called my buddy and I'm like, hey, um, I just got kicked out of my house. I was like, can I come stay at your house for a couple of days? He's like, sure, man, go ahead. You can come on over. So I go to his house. I tell him, you know, I'm drinking every day. She just kicked me out. I don't know what I'm going to do. I wrecked my truck yesterday. And his solution to the problem was, well, why don't we just go to the bar 
have a couple of drinks and we'll talk about it. <laughs> it's stuck with salty. <laughs> so I'm like, sure, man. I'm already kicked out of the house. You know, let's go have a couple of drinks. So we go to the bar. Drinks turn into shots. Hours, an hour turns into two or three hours. And we leave the bar. And I rear end somebody at the red light. Oh, so. The next day. And uh, I get out. And I, and I look at my front of my truck. Now the bumper's all smashed in. I look at the guy. I'm like, are you okay? He goes, yeah, I'm okay. And I look at his car. And actually, his car had no damage. I, I don't know if I hit his toe, toe hitch on the back. But his car had zero damage. And I said, okay. I said, well, your truck's okay. You're okay. I'm out of here. And I slapped him on his back. And I fucking, I got in the, my truck and I took off. Because mm. I, knew, I knew at that point, if the cops came, I was going to jail. I was drunk. Mm -hmm. Um. I drive back to my friend's house and I'm like, man, I, I, I can't stay here. I, I got to go. I got to go figure this out. I got to go sleep somewhere. So I leave his house, I stop at the liquor store, mm. get 10 more fireballs. Mm. And I go and park at a park and ride. Mm. And for the next two days, I turn my phone off and I sit in the back seat of my truck. This is at the end of February, right, right before March 1st. And actually, no, I, I, it was March 2nd. I, I, I sat in the back of my truck for the next two days and I drank and I listened to sad songs and I replayed the last 20 years of my life. Yeah. Just about all the things that I didn't accomplish, all the thing, all the people that I let down, all the people that I hurt, all the jobs that I've lost. And um, I really, really did a, a, a pity party for myself. And um, I, I just drank and drank and drank for 48 hours. Where do you think the anger came from? <sighs> the anger that I held on to for 30 some years was, was from my father leaving. Okay. Um, at, you know, and, I, and I said that at the beginning, at the age of six, he left. And there was multiple times I remember growing up and he, he would say, I'm coming to get you for the weekend, pack your bags. And, and I'd sit at the front door as a six, seven and eight year old little boy waiting for my father to come pick me up. And an hour would go by, two hours would go by. And then the phone would ring and he'd tell my mom, I can't come and pick up Tim. I had to work over or something came up. I couldn't tell you how many times I sat at the front door waiting for my father to come pick me up with my bags packed and he didn't come. Mm. It happened for years. And I thought there was something wrong with me as mm. a little boy. I thought that maybe I'm the reason why my mom and him got a divorce. Mm. Maybe I'm the reason why he left. My brother's 10 years older than me. Why did he stay until he was almost in, out of high school, but he left when I was in first grade? What's wrong with me? And I held on to that for, for 30 years. Mm. I, de I definitely use that as a crutch sometimes to drink because my father, why didn't my father love me? Mm. And that's what I would tell myself. Why didn't my father love me? What's wrong with me? Mm. He, why did he love my brother, but he didn't love me? Is there something wrong with me? It wasn't until I got into my 40s and I got into rehab March 5th of 2021, that I started to do some soul searching and some digging. And I realized that it had nothing to do with me. Mm. My father liked other women. He liked messing around on my mom. She couldn't take it anymore. And that's why they got a divorce. Mm. It had nothing to do with me. Now, the reason he didn't come and pick me up a couple of times is because he was out chasing women. Mm. And that's what he liked to do in his 30s. That's what he liked to do. And while in rehab and talking to the therapist and stuff, the, the, Tim, it's not your fault. Mm. You know, your father has an ego. He may be a narcissist. He may be egotistical. He may be selfish. It has nothing to do with you. They are his character defects and it had nothing to do with you. Mm. So why, when I started to get sober, I was finally able to forgive him. But, um, go back to sitting in the truck, how I got into rehab. After two days of sitting there drinking, I turned my phone on at seven after 10 in the morning. And at nine after 10, my phone rings. This is after 48 hours of having it off and my phone rings. 
and it's my childhood friend uh, Brandon Novak. Um, if you if you've ever heard of his name, he's one of the one of the guys in Jackass from all the movies. He's he was the guy that was always on heroin, always doing drugs. He was the worst addict in the whole group of those guys. Mm. And um, he calls me at this time. He's got four years sober and clean. And he calls me and he says, Lodgin, what are you doing? And I said, I'm in my truck. I'm cold. I'm hungry. I'm drunk and I'm tired. And he says, good. That's what you need. I just talked to your mom and I just talked to your wife. Mm. I have a plane ticket waiting for you this evening at 8 p.m. I want you to go down to Banyan Treatment Centers in West Palm Beach, Florida. Mm. And I want you to go get help. He said, and I promise you, everything that you've lost will get back 10 times fold if you get on that plane. Mm. And I said, okay, man, okay, I, okay, I'll go. And I hung up the phone and I was leery. I, didn't, I wasn't sure, but I said, yes. 15, 20 minutes later, my wife calls. Hey, I just talked to Brandon. Where are you? Can you please come home, take a shower, pack your bags, try to get some sleep? Um, you know, I, I really want you to go tonight. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll come home. So I drove home and, and I get home. I take a shower. I try to eat. I couldn't eat. I, I've been drinking for 48 hours. I haven't eaten. My stomach was now in knots because now I have not going to rehab. I'm nervous. I have anxiety. I don't know what, what to expect. So I couldn't eat. I tried to lay down and I really couldn't. My mind was racing, thinking of all these things. And, um, I sit on the edge of the bed and my addiction grabs me by the hand and walks me into the basement of my home and throws a rope around my neck and stands me on a bucket and tells me to jump off. Mm. And two minutes go by and my wife comes down the steps. And she sees me in the corner of the basement with a rope around my neck, standing on a bucket. And she says, what are you doing? And I say, I can't do it. And she says, please, Tim, please get down. Yeah. Do you know what this would do to your children? Please get down and go to rehab. Everything is going to be okay. Yeah. Just get down. So I get down and I, I fall to the floor and, I, and I, I think I sat there for like 10 minutes and I cried. I get up and I go upstairs and I pick up the phone and I call my friend and I said, hey, I'm going tonight. I got to go. I said, if not, this disease is going to kill me and, and I got to go. And all he says is, I'm proud of you. I love you. Call me when you get past security so that I know you're getting on the plane and you're not going to take a cab after you get dropped off and leave the airport. So I said, okay. My mom takes me. I get to the airport, get past security, and I call him. And he said, all he says is, I'm proud of you. I love you. And he hangs up the phone. Mm. I go to sit down in the seat. I got about 30 minutes before the plane tips off. As I sit down in the chair waiting for, my, for them to call us to board the plane, I get this overwhelming feeling of hope mm. that came over my entire body. It was a warm blanket feeling that I've never felt in my entire life. And something in my head at that exact moment said, everything is going to be okay. My anxiety went away, my panic went away, my worries went away. I don't know where it came from, but it didn't come from me. Mm. It came from someplace else. And it was the most amazing feeling I've ever felt in my life. Mm. And it was at that moment at the age of 44 that I knew I was right where I wanted to be, right where I needed to be to save my life. And this was the time after 27 years that my life was finally going to change. I fully accepted my new journey. Mm. I got to rehab. I went in both feet. I didn't miss a single meeting the whole 32 days I was there. I actually went to extra meetings for military service members that they had two extra meetings a week. 
I actually went to the two extra meetings a week on top of the seven meetings a day that we went to. I went full. My addictive personality from using drugs and alcohol went into sobriety and I went a hundred miles an hour into sobriety. Hmm. It was the biggest gift that I have ever been given in my entire life. And I will say that because without this gift of sobriety, I wouldn't have been able to have the gratitude of my kids and my wife. If I didn't have this gift of sobriety, I wouldn't know or understand how precious this life is that we have that was given to us. Mm. I've taken everything for granted, mm. every single thing. And now I know what, what, what special means, what a true gift of being able to wake up each and every day to possibly live out the dream that our higher power has been waiting for us. That it's now time that for me to live the life that he's been had waiting for me. And when I, when I first got sober, I did, I did question, why did I have to go through 27 years of pain and suffering? Why 27 years? And the more I read, the more meetings I went to, the more people I spoke to, the more I prayed. I realized that that's my story. Mm -hmm. And the 27 years that I had to go through was because I needed that much experience mm -hmm. to be able to share my journey with other people and able to give them hope in the recovery. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been able to have the gratitude of five or 10 years in addiction. For me, it was 27 years because I've had the full spectrum of life. That's, that, that's three quarters of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I truly understand now the meaning of life. And, and for me, I have finally found my purpose is to give back and to share my story of hope and recovery to those still suffering in hopes that they know that they can recover mm -hmm. and they can live the life the higher powers always had waiting for them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I had, ex I had an, an experience that I ignored that I now look back on and realize that I was trying to be reached, but I ignored it. And it was March 16th, 2017. And it was right when I was trying to stop the pain medicine and I couldn't, I went driving through this beautiful park we have here in Maryland and, and I'm beating on the steering wheel and I'm yelling up at the sky. I'm like, why can't I stop taking pain medicine? Why can't I stop drinking? What is my purpose? You know, I'm a piece of crap husband, father, son, friend. I, I, I can't keep a job. Why am I here? I don't know my purpose. Mm -hmm. If there's anything out there that can, that can just tell me that I have a purpose, please send me a sign, please. And I get around to the bend. And at this park area, um, my senior year of high school, my best friend unfortunately lost control of his car, hit the tree and, and passed away at the age of 17. Mm. And they have a little visual there at the tree. You have a book you can write to them. They have flowers on the tree still to this day. And I get around the bend, I get out of my truck and I go up to the tree. And I say, Bill, I need a sign that, that I have a purpose in life. I need to know that I'm here for a reason because I, I really feel lost. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know if I can ever stop drinking. I can't stop this pain medicine. And I just, I just, I need to know that I'm not alone. Please send me a sign because I don't know what to do. And I get back in my truck and I go to leave the park. And uh, instead of parking on the right-hand side and driving out, I actually pull over to the left-hand side on oncoming traffic and I park my truck. Hmm. And I sit there and I cry for about, an, I, I think, another 10 minutes. And as I'm sitting there, this car pulls up. And now we're, we're hood to hood. And I see the gentleman get out of his car. And he's got his dog in his back seat. And he gets the dog out. And he's about to take the dog over to walk by the water. And I look up. And I realize it's my best friend who passed away. It was his father. Mm whom I hadn't seen since 1996, the day of his funeral. Mm. And I get out and I say, Mr. Bill. And he says, Timmy, what's wrong? 
and I fall to the curb and I start crying. I said, I'm a drug addict. I'm an alcoholic. I don't know what to do. I just asked Bill to send me a sign. I, I, I don't, I don't know if it's you. And, and he comes over to me and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, Tim, Miss Denise, which was his wife who passed away. Miss Denise came to me in a dream last night. And she told me to come to this park at 10 a.m. this morning to walk the dog. He said, I was supposed to leave at 6 a.m. to go to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina to take a vacation. He said, but I didn't. And I came here right now this morning at this time. He goes, I truly believe I was sent here to give you hope and encouragement. Mm. When I left that park, it wasn't enough for me to stop using. Mm. I my addict brain and my addict way of thinking actually told me well now i'm being watched and everything is going to be okay so i can continue to drink and drug because i'm being protected Mm. that was my addictive thinking Mm -hmm. so for the next four years is when i drank the most that i've ever drank in my entire life which finally got me into rehab which finally got me on this journey of of sobriety, which has been the, the, the best, best gift I've ever been given in my entire life. That's just so, and, and, and I, I first want to, um, salute and, and commend your, your, your friend for, you know, getting you that plane ticket to, you know, to go to rehab and, you know, your wife, you know, after she kicked you out, she, you know what I'm saying? Came back and was, you know, looking out for you. A lot of people don't have that, you know, and, no. you know, and, and so, you know, you're, you're one of the fortunate, you know, I, I, had, I had, you know, my, you know, like I said, I did three rehab stints. I, before I got sober, I did one in Virginia. I did one in, uh, at Fort Belleville in Alexandria. And, um, that was, that was my second stint in rehab. And then this, this last one is where I was like, okay, enough is enough. And it, it did take. A family member so I'm glad because like I said you you're answering my questions without me even asking them but that was that was definitely uh something that was important to me because and I've heard you mention about your mother I'm very close with my mom and she basically told me um after I had went to the casino I when I first like I said I was I, I got out the army in 2016 and I went on a true alcohol bend for that whole year up until when I went back to Minnesota and I went to the casino, spent a hundred dollars to, to go to the ride, take a cab to the casino, paid another hundred dollars to come back home. And I didn't wake up probably until like about maybe two or three o'clock that afternoon. And my mom was like, she flat out told me, she's like, what do I need to do to help you? Because I don't want to bury, uh, you know, bury my son and I'm the youngest. And so it was like, when she said that, it was like, it didn't matter how much alcohol was in my system at that moment it was like, okay, yeah, I need to make the change. Yes, I still continued to drink because I, I wasn't ready. And I drank all the way up until a couple hours before I entered rehab in Minnesota, but definitely was the best decision. You know, my, my personal experience with, with rehab this last time is I already knew, okay, I, I knew the, 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 the grand scheme of it all, needless to say, and this time it was like, okay, I need to, I need to figure out how I'm going to survive once I get out of here. It did, you know, yes, this is 30 days, but I got the rest of my life to, to think about and figure out like, okay, what am I going to do? Where am I going to live? You know, I decided to go to grad school and get my master's degree, but still, and, and it, it's interesting that you're sharing your story because, you know, I quit drinking, like I said, five years ago, that was 37. And this was roughly around the time you had uh, stopped you know, taking pills. So yeah. uh, there, there's definitely the similarities. And, you know, the, the, the main thing that's important is that I guess in, 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 our, in our minds is that regardless of what people are telling us in terms of the help that we may need, we need to stop taking the pills. We need to stop you know, smoking weed or, or drinking is that we're going to still do it. You know, it, it's almost like if, if we, the only way is if we were ex, you know, you know, walked out in handcuffs and maybe we'll consider it, but if it's not something that's going to stick, then we're going to continue to do it. And, and that is an addictive personality. And so, like I said, I, I'm, I'm definitely happy that you got to a point and you realize, okay, enough is enough. 
and 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 like I said, it it it's 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 a good it's definitely a good feeling to to know that you can wake up and not have to to take as many shots as you were saying because I never my nephew drinks Fireball. Matter of fact, I saw him taking shots of that stuff in December, like literally a couple feet away from me, and I'm just like. You lucky you're my nephew slash, you know, we grew up together like my little brother. But I was like, man, if you was anybody else, I would not be in your presence. And, but I was like, hey, go ahead. I don't want it. I'm good. You know, I'll preach about being sober, but I'm not touching it. So yeah, that that's that's that that's heartfelt right there. Now, um, now let me uh no, no, do you now you 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 go to rehab. You, you, you do 32 days. Now, what was your plan once you got out of rehab? My, my, my immediate plan was to, to, to find a, a home group. And, um, you know, they preached the 90, the nine, 90 and 90. And um, I remember while I was in rehab, I was like, how the hell am I going to do 90 and 90? And I remember the guy looking at me and saying, did you drink every day? Mm-hmm. And I was like, of course. He said, how many hours a day? I said, oh. Uh, shit in the morning when I got off work all the way till I went to sleep he said so five six seven hours a day I was like yeah he said and you're telling me you don't have one hour a day for your sobriety and the rest of your life Mm. and I was like oh oh okay I I, you got me on that one he's like anybody can do 90 and 90 he said if they truly want this thing called sobriety Mm. I was like okay so I came home and um I, I went to like the like five different ones until I found the one that I really liked and I've really connected with. Mm -hmm. And when I walked into this place, it's called over the rainbow. Mm -hmm. And, and it was, it was a little place and the place was packed, had like 30 people in it. And I walk in and I'm feeling out of place. I'm one week fresh out of, out of recovery. And so I sit down and I'm like, man, I'm not really sure what to expect at this one because a couple of them have always been ran a little differently. So I'm sitting there and five minutes go by and it starts pouring down raining Mm. and then it stops. And then somebody walks in from the outside and says, everybody come outside and look at the rainbow over the building. Mm. And I go outside and I look, I look up and I'm like, okay. I was like, I get you. I said, this is the place I need to be. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's not a coincidence. And uh, I'm staying here. So that and this place is now my home group. And I actually ended up doing 98 meetings in 90 days. Mm. And at the end of the, the three months, after learning the steps and, and, and having a sponsor, I started to realize that I needed to look for a balance um, between mind, body and spirit. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to burn myself out with seven days a week meetings and nothing else. I didn't want to get turned off from the, the daily recovery meetings. So I, I started to do four meetings a week and I started to go to the gym and then I started to spend more time with my family. Um, so I would go to work. I I'd come home. I immediately go to the gym, spend time with family, and I moved my meetings to the weekends, two on Saturday and two on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I would do the first meeting on Saturday morning and the first meeting on Sunday morning, which is eight o'clock in the morning. That would start my weekend off. And then I would hit the seven or eight o'clock PM on Saturday and Sunday night. And for me, that worked for me. Mm-hmm. because it allowed me to go to work during the week, get my physical activity in and spend time with my family during the week, have dinner, watch movies, play with my kids. And then on the weekend, kind of, it was like Saturday ended my work week and gave me two meetings to, to refresh, refresh myself from the week. And then Sunday got me started for the following week coming up. So it was kind of like, that's how I looked at it is, The two meetings on Saturday ended my week and the two meetings on Sunday began my next week for me. So I started to try to find that balance in between it. So now that's how I've kept it ever since. Um, I go to work, I come home, I immediately go to the gym. Then I come home and I eat dinner with my family. 
I do whatever has to be done around the, around the house. And then we spend time together. Um, you know, when I was drinking, I would come home and the house would scatter like roaches with the lights coming on. Nobody wanted to be around me. Yeah. They, they didn't know what know dad was walking. <laughs> yeah, they didn't know what dad was walking in the door. Was I the silly, goofy, drunk dad? Or was I the angry, pissed off? Everything's going to set me off bad. Mm-hmm. Nobody would come around. Now when I come in, the girls come out of their room. You know, my wife's sitting on the couch. We eat dinner together. We watch movies. We laugh. We, we tell jokes. We talk about our day. It's a completely different atmosphere in my home now. You know, my, my wife will tell you, she has to pull teeth with me to even argue because mm-hmm. I just want everything to be peaceful. I, I want everything. I don't want no drama anymore. I, I don't want arguments. I, I'd rather resolve the issue than let that issue affect me emotionally to where I hold on to it and it, and it affects my mindset. Mm. So I would rather deal with things head on now and come up with a solution rather than another problem or another reason why I can't deal with it. I have found it in my sobriety to deal with things head on. It helps you so much easier. You're not, you're not carrying it over to the next day and then the next day and the next day. Mm. You're taking care of the problem as it happens and then you move on. Yeah. And, and it makes it so much easier. It makes it so much more of a peaceful life. Mm-hmm. I, I don't let things bother me any. Like I was a very angry driver. Now I just, I just let people do their thing. I mean, no, I mean, nine out of 10 times, there's some, excuse me, but there's some assholes on the road. You just got to deal with it. I just don't let it bother me anymore. You know what I mean? I'm like, okay, you cut me off. You must be in a hurry or, or you're just a jerk. And I'm not going to let it affect me. I'm going my way. I'm doing my thing. I don't let things affect me emotionally anymore like I used to. And it's such an easier way to live life. It really, truly is. That's what's so good. Now, um, <clears throat> are you involved with anything... Um, in the sober, sober and clean community, I noticed uh, on your IG, um, you, uh, you guys were you were speaking. Um, was that in Philadelphia? Was that? Philadelphia? Yeah, um, uh, two week, uh, the ninth. I went down to um, Kensington, Philadelphia. Okay. Which um, I don't know if you've ever been there, or have ever heard of it, but they call it the heroin capital of the United States. Oh wow! Um, there's an actual, there's a public park there in Kensington. And there's an actual four by eight sheet of plywood there and somebody spray painted needle park on it. And literally I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. Mm. It was something out of a movie. I'm not even kidding you. Mm. There was hundreds of people shooting up heroin and smoking crack during the day while the cops just sat there and watched them. Out in complete public daylight, sharing needles, passing out on the ground. It was a very sad thing for me to experience. Um, I've never seen anything like that. Um, That really showed me the true grasp of addiction, of what this disease does to people. Um, I had a friend, um, his name's Scott, Mr. Hope Dealer on Instagram. He's a minister. He goes down there and does outreach programs. He feeds the homeless. Um, he speaks with them. He prays with them, brings them food. And he had asked me and actually he asked me and Mike um, to come down and speak at his event. Okay. So Mike came down from New York. I came from Baltimore and we went down there and we spoke at the event. I brought a bunch of clothes to donate. Um, I donated a hundred bucks to get food for the homeless. And we sat there from one to six and we gave out food, gave out clothes. Uh, we spoke to people. We actually got two people to go to rehab that day. Um, the guy Scott had set up with a local rehab center. They had eight beds waiting for men and five beds waiting for women for us to bring them in and luckily we were able to get two people to go which is which is incredible um but that was that was a true eye-opener for me um 
you know, here I am, I, I'm dealing with alcoholism, my, my primary addiction. And to see heroin addiction at, at its peak was, it was a different animal. Yeah. It, um, that, that's a different lifestyle. I, I didn't, re- I mean, I knew about it. I knew heroin was really bad. I knew, I knew the whole gist of heroin and, and crack addiction and cocaine and stuff. But to, to see these people that look like living dead, mm. uh, um, not caring about anything, but just getting high. Um, it really affected me, you know, emotionally. I just wanted to help every single one of them. I, I literally wish I could have just went and, and put my hands on them and, and transferred my sobriety or my want, my want of recovery to them. Because, you know, at my deepest, I, I was hopeless. Mm-hmm. I had I had no hope. I, I really truly thought I was destined to die from this disease. I didn't care about anything else but getting drunk and, and, and getting high, and I, I only cared about myself. I didn't care about who I was hurting or who I was affecting. And to to go from that deep dark place of of wanting to take my life and trying once to living this life of of so much hope and so much possibility and and so much you know things that have been happening to me over this past year and and a year and a month i can't explain it other than it it, it has come from a higher power Mm. like it's like he had this this life waiting for me i just had to be willing to come and get it and and now that i'm willing to come and get it i'm willing to do the work because it doesn't come for free I'm willing to do the work. I'm willing to give back. The more I give back, it, it, it honestly seems like I get more. Um, and I always thought that was kind of bull crap. I was like, what do you mean? The more you give, the more you get. But the more I've given, the more things have been given to me. And I'm not talking money. I'm talking spiritually, um, peacefully, mentally. Um, you know, just being asked to be on this podcast, speaking to you, you couldn't have told me this in rehab that in a year I'd be sharing my stories with those still suffering, giving them possible hope to maybe even reaching one person that could possibly hear this podcast to let them know that they are not alone. Mm -hmm. They don't suffer alone. Their pain is not theirs alone. We've all gone through it. And we can all recover and we can all live the life that has been waiting for us. We just can't give up hope. I gave up hope and it almost took my life. Mm -hmm. Like, like many, like many, like many of us out there, you know, and, 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 and and they hear, they hear the, the outcome. Cause like I said, getting, you know, going through recovery, it doesn't have an age limit. It, it, it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't. So I, I, I commend you for, for, you know, doing it, you know, in your forties. Cause I'm gonna tell you, this is the, the, the only decade of my life that I haven't consumed alcohol. And, wow. and I don't know anything else in my forties of being sober, you know, and I'll be feeling, <laughs> I, I turned 43 in August and this is all I know. And and I want to continue it. I don't want to go back to anything else because like you said, my thought process is different. I'm much more happy. Yeah. I'm smiling. I'm, you know, more of a positive person. I'm, you know, I don't sit around and, and wallow in the pity of what, how bad the army did me or anything like that. It's like, okay, opportunities on opportunities. Like I knew, cause like I was trying to get my master's degree. Well, actually I was, I was enrolled. Um, at uh, University of Texas El Paso in 2014, but I was still drinking. And I know that I would have never received my master's degree if I had still been drinking, because I, I switched schools and went, you know, went to college in Minnesota and received it. But I know that was, that was pretty much what kept me sober. That's what kept my mind off of everything that was going on, except for the fact that I was, the first couple of months of my recovery, I was in the process of uh, you know, putting together a divorce. And so it was like, that was probably the hardest thing. And I thought I was going to like relapse early because of that situation, because I didn't know if she's going to try to take money from me or anything like that, but it didn't work out that way. So it definitely is a blessing. And um, 
So now um, I know that um, how okay here we go. How do you think your journey can help those early? And I know you you kind of just touched on it, but uh, we we're getting close to the end too. But um, how how do you think your journey can help those? in uh in recovery or um help them with the recovery or clean time yeah if somebody who has been an addict for 27 years can finally find the hope and the and and the, the courage because it, it takes a lot of courage to get sober mm -hmm. um if i can dig deep within myself and and find that want that hope, that courage, that I can finally find my why of, of my purpose in life to get sober. And somebody with a year or two or five years or six or 10 years can surely do it. 27 years is a extremely long time to be an addict. I, by all statistics, I probably should not be here speaking with you. You know, when I got to rehab, they did all these tests and the doctor told me my liver enzymes were four times what they should have been. Mm. And if I were to continue to drink the way I was drinking for the next two years, I wouldn't have made it to 48 years old. Mm. I didn't know that. Mm. I thought everything was fine. I was 25 pounds overweight. My face was this big. I had a big, huge belly. I had high blood pressure, high cholesterol. My liver enzymes are four times what it should have been. Mm. The unfortunate thing about this disease of addiction is it's that that old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Mm -hmm. I can, I can give you all my, my support. I can give you all my tips. I can, I can set up an appointment with you to go to rehab, but it all does truly stem from you. You have to finally want the help to save your life mm. and that is a very brave thing for somebody to do don't think of it as as being weak don't be ashamed of it the, when you finally admit that you need help and you're willing to do it that is the bravest thing that somebody can ever do is acknowledge the fact that they have a problem and they're willing to go get the help needed to save their life it's an amazingly brave thing for somebody to do. And if I can do it after 27 years that, that didn't want to live, that wanted to take my own life, if I could finally find that hope, then I know somebody else can. I know they can. I, didn't, I thought I was destined to die from this disease. Mm. The way that I look at life now, my perspective on everything is completely different, which I never thought was possible. Mm. I never thought I could live this life like this. Yeah. I never thought I could wake up in the morning and instead of saying, man, I got to go to work, I got to pay the bills. I say, I get to wake up. I get to go to work. I get the opportunity to pay my bills. Everything is a blessing. Mm. Our life is a blessing. And if, if people don't know this, the chances of you actually being born is one in 400 trillion. Mm. That is the odds. We have already won the lottery. Our lives are truly a gift. And I am coming for everything that alcohol promised and took from me. I'm coming for it all. And, I, and nothing's going to stop me now. Mm. I, I, I'm coming for everything that was taken from me that I gave away. It wasn't taken from me. I gave it away. Mm. I like that like that a lot well tim i'm truly out of questions like i said you you answered at least like six questions without me asking so that that makes my job a whole lot easier but um i, I wanted to first you know like i said um uh, say to you again thank you uh thank you for your service um oh, thank you for your service too thank you and and and, and i know that you know life after the military for a lot of us veterans it's not the easiest transition, regardless of if you, you know, you continue to drink or anything like that. Um, but the, 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 what's most important 
is that you, you know, you, you recognize the problems that you had and you were willing to accept them and then you were willing to work on them to make them better. And yeah. that, that right there is where I salute you because the more I hear these stories, regardless of if it's people who have more time um, in this journey than I do or less time, each story is, is somewhat different, but then we all, there's, there's some, like, some type of way we all end up coming together and the stories sound very similar. And yours yes. is different, you know? And it's, it's all about, you know, working working whatever program that's set forth in front of you and like i said we we function i mean we we, we still have to you know cohabitate in in society and so those problems are going to still be there um, we're going to still have bills to pay mortgages or rent to pay and in life changes you know every day there's going to be some type of adversity but now you have the strength, you have the power, you have the control to make those better decisions than to punish yourself like you may have done in the past. So I salute you. Um, Thank you. I, I truly appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you sharing your honesty, sharing your truth, because more and more people, you know, need to just, just tell it, you know, the, the trauma you may have witnessed as a child or if you didn't, you know, witness the trauma, or you didn't go through the party in, in early like myself at t 12, smoking weed at 13, you know, stuff like that. But it's, it's, it's all about what can we do today and what can we do to help the next person? And, and like I said, with, with this conversation, I know for sure that you've already have been an impact in just a short amount of time that you have. And I'm not saying like a negative thing, I'm just saying that in the time that you've been on your journey, you've already impacted a lot of people and you're gonna to continue to impact others. And I'm, I'm ready to witness it. We wanna see it and would love to meet you so that we can be out there together talking because you know, my, my degree is in communications and, and that's the, another facet that I wanna you know, get to at some point is to get out here and speak. And I was trying to do it in uh, Panama City Beach, but I was trying to speak at a couple of rehab facilities, but they didn't get back to me and I left. So I'm no longer there, but I, I might still eventually, once I get settled in my home in Georgia, that, oh, I shouldn't be saying that. Yeah, once I get settled in my home, I'll, <laughs> I'll be, I'll be uh, you know, going, you know, trying to, you know, either get on an army base or somewhere to where I can be able to, to utilize just the speaking you know, and trying to reach another, you know, soldier, veteran, whatever it is, because there's a lot of people out here to suffer in the day and they need to, you know, people like us is out here trying to, to let them know that there is hope and there is life after whatever negative stuff we may have had in our life. Absolutely. And that's truly what I want to do too. I, I, I've, I've messaged a bunch of detention centers around here. I've messaged high schools, mm -hmm. um, waiting for people to get back. I, I truly believe that, that the more I share, the more people I could help. And, um, you know, that's what I ask every night when I pray, I say, please let me reach as many people as possible who are suffering with mental illness and addiction so that they know they, there is hope and there is recovery and they can live a life that you've always had waiting for them. So that's my true purpose now is to share as much as possible. Okay. And then uh, before we go, um, let people know uh, your, your IG handle. I'm a, when, when I put it up on YouTube, I'm going to uh, also put on there, but you could just say it just, just in case. Um, those who are, are good listeners and don't want to read it, they can, uh, you know, write it down as they watch the video soon. Yeah, my, um, my, that's my basic platform is Instagram and it's at T L O D G A G E N. It's at T Lodgen. And, um, I'm a proud partner with Rockstar Testimony. They're a nonprofit organization that, that touches on mental illness and addiction as well. Okay. Okay. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So, um, you could send me that information as well. Cause what I'll do is. I'll put that in there if it, if you have a link for it and everything so that you can yes. get, get more traffic on that as well. A little more traffic. I know you probably got a whole lot of, as it is, but yeah. So like I said, thank you very much for coming on 12 Faces of Sober Speaks podcast, sharing your story. It definitely will. It has helped me and uh, making me want to do much more within the sober community. So like I said, thank awesome, you for man. blessing the show tonight. And uh, we'll definitely be in, uh, in touch soon. So like yes. I said, you guys, be, uh, stay tuned. This will be on YouTube uh, very soon. And like I said, hopefully 
you know, it'll be able to, to help you. If it doesn't help you, help a friend or a family member, coworker, whoever it is, somebody, a stranger, it may need to hear this. But uh, like I said, this is 12 Faces Sober Speaks podcast. Thank you again for uh, tuning in. And I uh, appreciate all the support. This is 12 Faces of Sober.